All right, guys. So uh, today I want to talk about how the world is in a state of limbo. And uh, apparently the word limbo actually comes from the Catholic theology, which means limbo is the afterlife condition of those who die in original sin without being assigned to the hell of the damned. Well, that's not in the Bible. Go figure, right? Catholicism. Um, if we look at a different definition of it, it means in an uncertain or undecided state or condition. This is, this is a lot of people in the world. I think it's everyone. Everybody right now is experiencing this limbo. Everybody feels like they are stuck in limbo. I feel it. I feel it. Where there is nothing certain anymore at all. There is nothing concrete. People cannot even say anything that's 100% anymore. People's cognition, cognitive abilities have been affected by the almighty gaslighting that happened during the COVID era. And now this cognitive dissonance where there's inconsistencies in thoughts, beliefs, and commitment to whatever. Because they have been gaslit and the effect, the effect of being gaslighted is that you start to doubt your own sanity, your own reality, your own beliefs. And now you can no longer be coherent in anything. You are not stable-minded, forever feeling like you're on a boat tossed around by waves, unending, the wind constantly blowing, never reaching the shore, having nothing to hold on to, rain blasting on your face, this in particular is hitting young people the most and because young people have been brainwashed in schools in which they were not taught how to properly uh, use their cognitive minds how to properly use critical thinking they were hit the hardest and now being in the state of limbo as they are can you really blame them for them not actually paying attention to anything that's going on they don't have the capability to do so. They don't. They really don't have the capacity to do so at all. Those who do are those who run the furthest away from the truth because it's too grim, because it's too uncertain. There is no job security anymore. American men are quitting their jobs because of toxic work, work culture. I had an experience with that. Um, working for a law firm, an American law firm, where the micromanagement is just ridiculous. The feminist women running amok and just looking for an excuse to fire you makes you wonder, why do you hire a man to begin with? Right? Micromanagement all the way to how often you should smile and how often you shouldn't. This is, this is insanity. This is not how men are built to work. And so you got a lot of guys dropping out of the job market because the micromanagement is our, against our DNA and the lack of a return of investment for all our efforts makes us feel like, what the heck is the point? How could you demand that I give you all my time and get one day off if I'm lucky, but then I don't make enough money to actually start a family? I don't make enough money to fund my pension. What is the point? So you got a lot of young guys quitting. They quitting because there's no return of investment. You got a, a lot of people who are still in their jobs, but showing up to work drunk, showing up to work stoned in order to keep working as a slave, in order to be numb to the reality of how terrible the working condition is. And in doing so, they damage their cognitive abilities further. And then when you damage it further, you become, well, a zombie. You become a victim. You become open to the de devil's attacks, the devil's new devices in order to deceive you. Because all you're looking for is relief at this point if you're still in your toxic job. If you're giving everything you have for absolutely nothing, that all that you earn is just to buy milk, eggs, 
and peanut butter. Nothing else anymore. You have to budget. Good luck with that because you can't save anything. This I know also is happening in Europe because a friend of mine told me so. This is legit crazy and no Christian is talking about this. No Christian is talking about the practicality of living in these end times and so everybody is in a state of limbo. If you cannot talk within the dispensation we're in, what good are you? What good are you as a Christian? How are you edifying other believers when you are not engaged in the current reality? Too occupied having milk and cookies with, with some friends of yours and not looking at what's actually happening. But you want to say, I'm doing the Lord's work. No, you're not doing the Lord's work. No, you're not. Other Christians just want to be consumers. You just want to listen and listen and listen and listen and never do anything. What good is forever hearing the word but never doing the word? Right? And because of this behavior, we are in a, stuck, we're in a state of limbo where we don't know what to do. We don't know what's happening. You feel like there's a rope around your neck and at any moment, they are going to push you so you can hang. You just don't know what it is. You're on that boat, swinging left, right, and center because of the waves. You don't know when you're going to smash into a rock. Right? And some will say, hey, you need to believe the Lord's the foundation. Don't be like Peter and pay attention to the storm. Pay attention to Jesus. Well, Jesus is a God of context is a God of dispensationalism. We are not in the Old Testament anymore, and we want to have a look over here. Looking at 1 Kings 19, this is about Elijah when he ran away after Jezebel threatened to kill him. And if you're in a state like me, you should be able to relate to him a little bit, right? So let's start reading from uh, verse 4, right? This is after he got the letter from Jezebel. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. Now, Elijah had had enough. He had, he had enough because they killed all the prophets. He was the only one left. And even Elijah, a dude who pretty much killed 600 or 300 false prophets, ran faster than a horse, right, called fire down from heaven, this guy was scared of a little Jezebel. What does this show? It shows that despite having access to the Almighty God, it does not necessarily completely change the fact that you're still a human being. And I am using the, the, the definition of human being as well, you're flawed, but not as an excuse to continue to be flawed, but definitely you are flawed. It's like, bro, you called heaven down. I mean, you called fire down. You ran faster than the horse. The spirit is with you and you're running away from a crazy woman. What's wrong with you? This here, without a doubt, is written for our learning so that those who want to say, hey, you, you're with Jesus Christ. He's the almighty king of kings. You shouldn't feel this way. It's not about feelings. I wish you could tell Elijah that. If you had reread this, would you say something like that? Are you saying Elijah had no right to feel the way he did? Maybe he didn't, but he sure as heck did to the point where the Lord actually understood and raptured him. Right? Elijah didn't die. So let's continue reading verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came again and 
second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. Notice here the Lord did not want Elijah to die. Elijah most likely was planning to starve himself, right? Purposely ran into the wilderness, wanting to starve himself. That's exactly what I daydream about. I daydream about falling in a hole, never being found, right? I daydream waking up on, on, on a mountain and just falling off. Why? Because I've had enough as he has had enough. Nobody, nobody listened to Elijah. Despite all the miracles he performed and yada yada, no one cared, no one listened, they wanted to kill him. That's how I feel. That ought to be how you feel. If people are caring what you're saying and they, they love you and, and, and think everything's great, hey man, you're not saved. Uh, plain and simple. You are, not, you are not on the narrow path at all. You're not. And so you need to reassess what path you're actually on if you have like a hundred friends, right? Um, verse 8, And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horab, the mount of God. Forty days and forty nights. Hmm, foreshadowing, huh? And he came uh, thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he says, And Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, throw down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Right? This, this is exactly it. This is why he ran away. He was in a state of limbo that, what exactly do you want me to do now, Lord? What do you want me to do? No one cares, okay? I'm the only one left. But we know that he wasn't the only one left. The Lord had reserved 7,000 unto himself. The question then is, where the heck was the 7,000 while Elijah was there? Where are they? Why didn't the 7,000 come and give comfort to Elijah? I don't know. If there are still thousands of people in this particular country that are saved, where are they? Is it possible that the Lord has reserved himself a couple here? Well, yeah, but I, I don't feel like it. And Elijah didn't even know about it. That's why he was told that he has reserved 7,000 for himself. But at the end of the day, Right At the end of the day, the Lord understood Elijah's pain as he understood Jonah's pain. When Jonah just wanted to die, Elijah wanted to die. Jonah was allowed to die. Elijah was just raptured. And so the Lord gave him one last mission that go anoint this particular king and go anoint Elisha to be the next prophet. Right? So that he can be taken away. So this, this, this particular uh, chapter here is from a different dispensation. And understanding dispensationalism, we know that the Lord does not operate the same in every generation. That does not mean he changes his mind. It just means different things need to be fulfilled a different way. But that does not mean it breaks the covenant of the Old or New Testament at all. Since the New Testament is a new dispensation of grace and truth, right? Did it, does it mean it breaks the Old Testament dispensation? No, it fulfills the Old Testament dispensation. And so those who will say, hey, um, you, you shouldn't feel this way or you should read about Elijah, you, that's a different dispensation. Elijah's life only applies to me in how I feel. But how I will end up, I don't know if I'm going to be raptured in, within my lifetime. I hope so. If I pay too much attention to the fake news, I'll start thinking so. But because the media sensationalizes everything, it's fake. They've been saying, um, what's that country? Poland is going to be part of NATO. For what, two years? 
since last year they said oh within three weeks we'll be part of nato and that's going to trigger world war three well it didn't happen paying attention to worldly news and taking it as a indicator that we are this far ahead or that far ahead that is the wrong thing to do it's the wrong thing to do at this point because these people are undecided it is not them who fundamentally decide it's time to butcher the world it is god himself who gives the go-ahead by removing the restrainer now this restrainer is still here which is the church the antichrist cannot be here without the church leaving because if the church doesn't leave and the antichrist comes he's going to kill all the christians and if he kills all the christians then that breaks 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 50, that not all of us will die, but if we all die, then Paul lied, you see. And then the 24 elders are not who they claim to be. And so people need to comfort others according to the correct dispensation. Now, if we go to Acts 27 again, there about Paul and the others being stuck on the boat, right? What well, the boat was falling apart. The boat was falling apart and all the men wanted to jump off. And Paul says here in verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. So in other words, the turbulence and state of limbo that we are experiencing right now, it's like, hold on, hold on to the boat, hold on to the ark. The ark is Jesus, right? You are in his body, right? He is the ark. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Despite knowing that, I do not feel any better. I don't. I don't feel any better. And we see that Elijah never felt any better either. And now it's like, how can a person feel any better? Pay attention to Jesus. That's, that is wrong advice. Of course, you, you're supposed to pay attention to him. But again, as I said earlier, he's the God of context. Right? And so within context, he tells you that man shall not live on bread alone. For those who want to say, at least you got food in the fridge, at least you got running water. Man, I'm not, I'm not an animal. I'm not an animal. Man shall not live on bread and water alone, but the entire word of God, right? Well, the entire word of God says a man must work. A man must work. And the only reason there is cognitive impairment happening to me is because there's a lack of work. And I see now that it is not my fault because there are men quitting their work because the work is too toxic and there's no return of investment and there is no saving for their time when they get older. So they lose their livelihood and on top of that, a lot of them lost their jobs because they didn't want to take the monkey sauce, which is the injection. So for those who took the monkey sauce, oh well, for whatever reason you took it, but there are those who saw the parallels that, oh, can't buy or sell. Uh, this sounds like the mark of the beast. Uh, yeah, I don't want to take it. Right. And so a lot of people lost their livelihoods because of that. Uh, many people still continue to suffer because of that. And uh, now it's like, but Lord, I didn't take the monkey sauce. I don't have a job. And I see that all the jobs are toxic. Everybody who has a job is complaining about it. Everybody who has a job needs to take multiple pills just to fall asleep. I could reason to myself and say, the Lord is protecting me. It's like, I appreciate it, but look at the damage that it's creating to my psyche, not having one. Because everybody's different. Others can handle not having one. Others can't handle having one. I'm the type of person 
who can handle having one. As I handled having a very toxic micromanagement style job working for a bunch of feminists. I could handle that. And then when the feminist woke up on the wrong side of bed, she decided to fire me. Which I knew the moment I saw her face that she's going to fire me. I knew it day one and it happened. So in this state of limbo, it's like, Lord, I don't know what to do. None of us know what to do. Nobody can even comfort anybody anymore because half have got their brains totally jacked up through the gaslighting of the COVID era or they took the, the, the monkey sauce and some of their brains are, are, are not functioning very well. There is cognitive impairment to some degree to all people now. To all people. And so it is very hard to maintain relationships because you just cannot express yourself very well anymore. There is a desire to be gathered with others, but there's also a great fear to be gathered, uh, gathered with others because they might disappoint you. That's me, but there's nobody to be gathered with here in this country. Now, if we were to look at Daniel 7, uh, at verse 23, this is prophecy of uh, the Antichrist, basically. So here at verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. We are in the foreshadowing of this. Oh, this is already ca currently actually happening. The devouring of the entire world and taking the, the, the kingdoms and merging them basically uh, means a lot of things are going to fall apart norms are going to fall apart and so that's part of the work culture the work culture is falling apart because the devil doesn't want man to work the lord created adam put him in the garden to work in the garden the devil being the exact opposite says nah i don't want man to work i want him to sit still and go insane and this is why here in africa or everywhere this is part of the reason why men commit crime. Because if there's no return of investment, right, either through respect or appreciation or financially, they will resort to crime. Always. It's, it's impossible not to. I would have been a criminal. Every day I think about, well, if I were to be a criminal, what could I do? I think I'd just be an assassin, really. But I can't do that, all right? But I am showing those who never considered these things, those who benefited from the satanic system ever since 1950. You were brought up after World War II when things were still sunshine and rainbows, and now you have gotten your assets that you're about to lose anyways, but ultimately you still got them. And so you have comfort in the assets you have. And now you magically believe that young people can accumulate the same assets as you have through this satanic system as far down the rabbit hole as we are. That is a big no-no. That is something you did not consider. This is why you can't judge young people anymore. You can't. You can't. I can't. I cannot. I cannot because I totally understand. And I remember uh, one crazy church girl telling me, um, hey, you should just name it and claim it. Declare this and the Lord's going to give it to you. Well, of course, that doctrine is from the prosperity gospel. And uh, this is somebody who doesn't live in reality. This is somebody who's following the doctrines of demons. And the demons can reward, right? And I was, for a moment, I felt rather special when she said, hey, I think, I think the devil's holding you back because he knows that if you were like out there, um, you'd, be, you'd cause him big trouble. I felt kind of special. But then I realized that this ain't the devil. This is not the devil at all. This is the system falling apart. This is 
a grand sacrifice of heterosexual men driving them to insanity, crime, or suicide, right? In order to just push along the portal for the Antichrist to walk right through, basically. That's all it is. It's not personal. I'm not personally being attacked by the devil or his demons. It's not personal. Every guy is going through this, my age or younger. I know a dude who's 22 years old. He already quit his job, went to go live in the middle of nowhere and is playing video games day in and day out because he said it's not worth it. I can't give my soul for nothing and then be disrespected and be called a toxic man for just being alive. You see, if we look at verse 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. We are in the foreshadowing of this, definitely, right? I don't know who the Antichrist will be, Trump, whoever, I don't know. Um, but of course, the dispensation here is talking about the saints in the tribulation. Uh, particularly the Jews, not the tribulation saints. Because the tribulation saints all have to die in the tribulation, right? And then the Jews are a different case. And so, the saints being worn out right now in this foreshadowing is us. It's us. Tired, in limbo, don't want to do nothing, can't commit to anything. I've tried to pick up a pencil. I, I, it, it's so hard. It's so hard. There is absolutely no future, nothing. No one can say we're going to be raptured uh, this September. No one knows the day or the hour, right? I used to believe in what the, in the feast days people say that, no, we can know the day or the hour, blah, blah, blah. Well, after like three years of being wrong, clearly, man, I, I don't think so. And in the meantime, that's what I'd like to focus on. In the meantime, somebody, somebody tell us, what can we do? Our fathers were useless. They did not teach us anything, us young people. Our uncles, same thing. Our big brother, same thing. Where are our dads in the spirit? Where are they? Where, where, where is the grandfather in the spirit, where are the elders who are able, who are able to decipher, dispensationally speaking, and correctly advise with wisdom what young people can do now? Because the lack of such elders is just making things worse. It is dividing people further and further and further. People can't talk to anyone anymore because they don't think they would understand them. You just want to throw random scripture at them without context. You want to tell them how they feel when you have not heard everything they have to say. What the heck is wrong with you? To tell them to feel otherwise is to tell Elijah to feel otherwise. Elijah, who God himself understood what he felt and raptured him. And so now comes a human being saying, you're not supposed to feel this way. It's not about how you should feel. Feelings is all we have left. It's all we have left. And this is why everybody's intoxicated. Right? I won't lie. I, I tried. I tried to have a whole bottle. A whole bottle of liquor. I just couldn't do it. It just made me sick. I am forced to be sober. And it burns. And the damage that it does, being sober in this hellhole of, of a world, is that it damages my cognitive abilities. I actually have slip-ups where I do see slight developments of personality disorder. And I tell the Lord, do you want me to go crazy? Do you want me to turn into a schizophrenic freak? 
I can't handle what's happening. You're not letting me have a sip. You're not letting me have a hushy. You're just letting me roast. What the heck is going on here? My heart does not like the living God. If I'm being honest. This is why it is written that the heart is full of deceit and evil. Who can ever know it? But my mind is the one that reminds me that this is all part of the end game. You can't throw in the towel just yet. You can't throw in the towel just yet. But I'm being honest. My heart, heart is solely based on feelings. And my feelings have always just been hurt, disappointed. And so obviously my heart feels the Lord has forsaken us. He disappeared. He left. He created another universe and left us to die here. That's how my heart feels. My mind reminds me of what's written. And that, hey man, this is part of the end game. You just gotta hold on. But, I, yeah, I am holding on. But I don't, I don't know what's gonna happen. And this state of limbo is very, very scary. It's like constantly free falling, like you're in the bottomless pit, never touching the ground but constantly falling. It really, really does drive people insane. The fact that I am developing bits of schizophrenia, that those aren't demons. No, that's just your mind's capacity no longer being able to handle reality. Your mind is starting to break. And if I do go crazy, well, I know it won't be my fault. So whatever. Um, but does anybody else talk about this? No, they'd rather talk about what Joel Olstein said or milk and cookies or um, what Israel is doing, blah, blah, blah. Iran's going to blow up Israel. Yeah, since 1992, bro. Oh, Erdogan in Turkey said this or that. Oh, Russia, this, Russia, that. Oh, the satanic temple, this, that. No one cares. Wars and rumors of wars. Demon worshippers, they've always been there. What exactly? If you if anybody deems themselves a true Christian, where is the proof that you have assessed this reality in order to survive it properly and advise others? on how to survive it properly within context. Within context. Where are these people? Where are they? We don't want to hear about Creflo Dollar stealing $5 billion. We don't want to hear about Joel Olstein lying again. We want to hear how the heck to develop coping mechanisms in this hellhole, this is the practicality. The greatest coping mechanism of the early church was work. Every man had a job back then. Paul made tents. Peter was a fisherman. Yada, yada, yada. Now the devil has taken away work. Or is making work so unbearable and so, um, uh, yeah, so unbearable that men are quitting. But those who quit obviously have some assets on the side, have something to fall back on, otherwise they won't starve to death, obviously. But ultimately, those who still remain are showing up to work drunk. They can't help it. I don't blame them. I, I cannot judge them. I just can't. They either drink themselves silly or they go insane. I'm going insane. If I'm going insane, it's not even my fault, then, then hey, I, I don't even know. The, and you see that term, I don't even know. I don't know what to do. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's called being in limbo. Because your subconscious knows any decision you make makes no difference in reality. You get a job, it can't change your overall reality. I personally want a job so not to think about my reality. 
If I were to think about a part of reality, it would be how horrible the job is, but ultimately, at least, it will shield me from the grand reality of nothing is changing and that the globalists are getting away with everything. That, to me, would be enough. It would be enough. But hey, I don't know what to do. And I suppose those who could not advise others on what to do is because they don't know what to do either. But at least be honest about it. So we all don't know what to do. So what good are we? Seriously. What, what good are we? We don't know what to do. We don't know what to say to each other. We don't, we don't know anything. Even though I have assessed the state we're in, that this is the last dispensation, basically, it doesn't make me feel any better as Elijah never felt any better, despite knowing and doing what he did. Doesn't. Don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. So we don't say anything. And the more we don't say anything, the deeper in the hole we, we fall in, the lonelier we feel. And the sooner we just want to jump off a cliff. This is the reality that we're in and nobody can talk about or will not talk about or cannot talk about because either they're cognitively impaired or they have no words or they haven't realized it yet or whatever. But we're in limbo. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know how much time I got left. I don't know anything. And Paul said, I confess to know nothing except the Lord Jesus crucified. Yeah, that's the only, I, the only thing I know is the gospel and my testimony. That's it. That's it. Everything else, I don't know anymore because even knowing makes no difference. I suppose... It's all over for everyone now. We have nothing to offer each other, I guess. Man, that's just bad news all the time.